Whether you're looking for them or not, birds are all around us. A constant presence in the air, land, and sea. How do you make sense of it all? Well, that's where we come in. Every week we scour the globe to bring this world to you. From the farthest reaches of nature, all the way to your own backyard. And whether you're an experienced birder or stepping into this world for the first time, things are about to take off on BirdCast Coast to Coast. Welcome to the BirdCast. Whether you know it or not, birds are always all around us. And certainly in these times, they're able to connect us. Rich, you're the man. Spring is here and they're back. A lot of these birds traveled up from the tropics down in South America or the Caribbean or Central America, and now they're home. This is a busy time of year for them. They got a lot of work ahead of them. Well, and it wasn't the best spring that we've ever had around here either, and that it was quite chilly throughout the month of May, but now that we're into June, things are heating up and the bird activity is doing the same. That's right. You know, it's a funny thing that the birds down in Mexico on their way through Texas have little regard for the weather up here at the moment. They're interested in getting back. And when they do, yeah, the weather ought to be improved enough for them. The bugs will be out, food is served, and time to nest. Well, that's it. As we said, springtime is here. Everything is in motion. So now we're going to take a look at what's been going on in these parts here over the last couple of weeks and what's to come. Now we're going to take a look at some top stories that are going on with springtime being here. Females are on the nests and the males, well, they're out and about, Rich. The male's job is to make sure the female is safe and the territory is secure. He does that by singing. Can you imagine that, settling territorial disputes through a song? Well, just like a long time ago in Africa, they used to settle things with poetry. Birds are gonna be singing, and you had mentioned earlier too, there's a difference between a song and a call. Songs and calls are very different in the bird world. Calls are generic. Everybody can call. Uh, the moms, the pops, the kids, everybody calls. And it can mean a number of different things from here I am, I'm hungry, how are you, or just hiccup. The song, however, says a whole different story. It's both a love song and fighting tune. Uh, they're singing their tune to the female, keep her attracted, keep her in place, keep her at the nest, make her safe. And other males that might be thinking of moving into the territory, they're saying stay away. This spot is taken. And territories can pretty much be anywhere. They can be in the treetops or in the case of across the pond, they can be on a windowsill. Some owls have decided to take up shop there and uh, they're interesting looking creatures. Well, definitely are. Uh, the, um, a lot of birds, when it comes down to nesting, some of them get rather desperate in terms of uh, finding their appropriate spot. And if they something that, if they find something that's suitable, it's good enough for them, they'll move right in. Their job is to raise a brood of babies, a next generation of birds, and um, they try to make it the safest and uh, best available spot around. Sometimes it's not what we think of as the best spot. Mm -hmm. It could be an urban ledge and a, a balcony, or it can be a deep wooded area someplace in a wilderness. That's great, so we're not necessarily talking about it has to be right in the throes of nature. It can be anywhere where the birds feel safe or maybe some place that they haven't been in a long time, like on Cape Cod, where the first nest with eggs of a bald eagle has been found in 115 years. Well, the bald eagle has made a remarkable comeback uh, to the point where we are at a, a virtual extinction, extirpation here in the northeast of North America. And uh, after the ban on pesticides, there was a vacuum in nature ready to be filled. And the bald eagle was ready and waiting. And uh, with a little bit of help, we brought them back and now all the good spots are taken and the bald eagle is looking around for the low rent district and they're moving in. And uh, some of the sites where they've been um, missing for a hundred years, they're now back comfortable and right at home. And would you consider the bald eagle to be the top predator, at least in these parts? If you were a fish, the birds go? yes. A bald eagle is generally a fish eating bird. Um, they will help themselves to carry in if they can find it. Uh, but mainly they're interested in um, uh, snagging a good fish. Uh, so there are plenty of other uh, predators out there, but um, the uh, bald eagle and the fish get along just fine. Not so much for the fish, but the, the eagle is happy. 
It's funny that you mentioned that about fish too, because I remember a story and saw the video of it, of a killer whale that attacked a great white shark. It was a fascinating thing. People were really into that. And we have what I believe to be sort of the bird equivalent of that. That's why I asked you about the bald eagle, because a bald eagle, well, has been killed and uh, it's a little bit of a murder mystery. Well, sometimes things don't go as planned and uh, that's nature for you. Um, as the saying goes, it's a jungle out there. And, and all birds of prey have to pick their target carefully. Uh, one mistake and it could be bad news for the, both the predator and the prey. This all took place at the end of July. Um, of 2019, a kayaker was out on a pond and found a dead eagle in the water. And he did what he was supposed to do. He called uh, the main warden service. As with any eagle that we find dead, we want to know what, how it died um, and make sure that it, something illegal didn't happen. So the warden took it to a veterinarian who then did a, um, an x-ray just to make sure it wasn't shot illegally. Um, but at the same time, when they found it, they also found a loon chick nearby that was dead. And so seeing that and seeing the dead eagle, they kind of put two and two together, collected both. And um, then we kind of went from there and decided something might have happened to this eagle that's tied to this loon chick's death. When they brought it to the veterinarian, they not only took an x-ray, but they also did just an external exam, and they found um, a wound to the chest of the eagle. And the wound was such, it was kind of like a puncture wound. There was suspicion that maybe, knowing that the loon chick, the dead loon chick was nearby, maybe an adult loon actually caused uh, that puncture wound to the eagle's chest. And we arranged to have uh, the eagle uh, and the loon chick necropsied, which is basically an autopsy of a wild animal, um, to determine how that eagle actually died and whether or not our suspicion that maybe an adult loon actually caused the eagle's death was true. We wanted to investigate this to see if indeed a lo an adult loon had killed the eagle because we had never really seen that happen, or at least it was never been, had never been documented that an adult loon had killed an eagle. The person who did the necropsy took measurements as she was taking the eagle apart to look at its inner organs and everything else. She paid close attention to the size and the shape of that opening. And um, sure enough, she said that it really did look consistent with um, an adult loon's bill. It was just kind of a good piece of information for all of those who are studying loons and trying to understand how the two species interact. Well, a loon is not a usual uh, target for bald eagles. It's, it's a little bit off the chart. And they are a pretty tough little bird. And uh, they have a very sharp beak and a lot of gumption. So the eagle tackling with that loon made a big mistake. Now, one of the things that we really enjoy about this show is to help you get involved, and you can do that by doing your own backyard birding. And as a meteorologist, I used to get a lot of emails from people in February into March, and they would say, hey, I saw my first robin, spring is coming. And I always try to tell them that that's not exactly the case. Rich, tell me a little more about that. Well, that's very true. Uh, the robins in the Northeast North America usually stick around. Some of them are around all winter long. Uh, they're here. They haven't gone away. Many of them have. Many of them spend the winter in New Jersey and North Carolina, Florida. Uh, but some of them stick around all through the winter. They gather up in a favorable spot with a little bit of food and shelter. And uh, as a group, they just hunker down and weather it through. When the weather starts to break and people are looking out the window, at, they see a robin on the lawn. Well, that robin is now a conspicuous bird. They broke up from their flocks, the overwintering flocks, and they show up on people's backyards, and there they are. Uh, although they're here in the spring, they're not really the harbinger of spring that we like to think that they are. The real harbinger, I think, is the red-winged blackbird. 
uh, they're gone for the winter. And when they come back and start singing, you know spring is in the air. And they have a very distinct song. Where do they go? Not far. Uh, the, the blackbirds in general uh, in America tend to go down to the southern states, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, Arkansas, Texas. Uh, and California. And then when springtime starts to uh, move northward, they return with spring. They come back north with the earliest uh, indications of spring. Sometimes they'll move into an area and uh, there'll be a blizzard waiting for them the next week after they get home. So they'll note to self, next year I need to stay a little farther south this time. Well, that plus. The thing is about it is the male birds show up first. And what they're trying to do is establish a territory early on. They want to be first at the best. And everybody else behind them has got to take second choice. And they are a rather aggressive species, are they? Well, they're assertive. Um, again, they do their, they do their territorial uh, staking out by song. They sing the corners of their marked territory, and the other birds have an unwritten rule. They honor it. Of course, these lines of territory aren't straight and uh, narrow. What they, they blend a lot. They come and go. It could be this bush, that shrub, that fence post today, and uh, be the shrub on the other side tomorrow. Uh, so they're, it, that line is very, very flexible, and it's all about food. It's how much food is available and how they feel they can uh, take care of their family during the nesting season. So we've gotten a couple of sightings now, the robins and then the red-winged blackbirds, but another segment that you'll enjoy as we go take you throughout this series is called our sightings of the week. And this week we have a streak-backed oriole. Uh, this was taken in Brewster County, Texas, which is uh, it's a really incredible bird. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about the coloring of that. But first, Rich, tell me a little bit about um, this particular uh, oriole. Well, Orioles are members of the blackbird family, the same family as the red-winged blackbird, uh, curiously, and they're very colorful. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of different varieties of Orioles uh, from um, the East Coast down to the Pacific Coast and down through the Rio Grande Valley in Florida. The thing about this particular Oriole is it resembles the Baltimore Oriole that's found in the East, but it has a dark back that has a number of dark, darker streaks going down the middle of the back. And uh, it's not native to our area, not Texas or anywhere else. And uh, you get these overshoots, these uh, wandering birds that wander away from their normal distribution and uh, venture into new ground, new territory. And these pioneers could be the establishment of a new population that's expanding its range northward, or could be just a lost guy that sooner or later will have to turn around and go back home. And this particular one that was taken in Texas, so it's interesting you say that that's not their general habitat. So no, not at all. decided to make it up there. So now we're going to head from Texas a little bit farther to the north up to Kingfisher, Oklahoma. This is a really cool photo, Rich. Uh, this is a, a hummingbird that was found, and it is about three times the size, as the author notes here, of the usual uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. And if you could talk a little bit about that, what really jumped out to me is the size of the beak. Yeah, this is a very unusual sighting. I believe it's the first occurrence of this species of hummingbird for Oklahoma. It's called the Rivoli's hummingbird, uh, and it is huge. I mean, in ter hummingbird terms, this thing is way bigger than the ruby-throated or rufous hummingbird that we normally find in our neighborhoods around the country. And um, that it showed up at a backyard feeder is just remarkable. And more remarkable is that the people had the wherewithal to recognize that it was different and get a photograph. Have you seen one in the wild? I have not. These are found down through Mexico and uh, the uh, Arizona and New Mexico border, and even there, they're rare. Wow, so they were pretty far away from home. They do. This one, this one wandered a little bit off course. Well, we're gonna wander a little bit farther northwest to the northwest up into Spokane County, Washington. This is an Eastern Phoebe that was found, and uh, this is a, a little guy here. It actually looks sm smaller than the hummingbird that we just showed you. Well, actually, he's larger. It's just, but the Eastern Phoebe, the Phoebe is a type of flycatcher, and we have two different kinds in America, the Eastern Phoebe, and out west, it's a bird called the Sage Phoebe. And uh, the Eastern Phoebe wandered, this particular one, worked its way out, all the way out to the state of Washington, it showed up in a backyard. The person recognized the song, which actually is how the Phoebe gets its name. It says its name. It says Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. A little sneezier and fuzzier than I do it, but they got it right. 
so the person recognized the song and said, that's not our usual Says Phoebe. Went out, checked it out, and it was an Eastern Phoebe, and I think it was the first for that, uh, that particular county in Washington. Again, birds wander. Some of them get a little disoriented. Some of them wander beyond their normal boundaries. And um, he's out there singing his song, waiting for a mate to show up. Good luck to him. Well, and it's amazing too, as I'm learning things literally by the second here, and hopefully you are too, um, you wonder how many of these opportunities we miss for somebody like me that wouldn't recognize a Phoebe in a place where it maybe shouldn't have been. You're absolutely right about that. And, uh, and I like to say to people, expect the unexpected. If that bird looks unusual, it probably is. And people, you know, I, I think overall, people have a general sense of the birds that are around them. They see them, they can hear them. And so it, it's a nice little mindful thing to have just to say, hey, just like you said, let's take a look at this and see maybe if Rich can identify it for us. Well, I'm more than happy to give it a, tr a try. And the, the, the fun thing about bird watching is that it keeps the mind active. You get used to the, the uh, ordinary, you get uh, complacent, you get expecting the ordinary. And as I say, uh, expect the unexpected and keep, your, keep on your toes, be ready for the challenge and try to get that identification and the picture. Well, and it's, I think this is a nice little natural segue into a new segment that we have as well. Uh, this is the Backyard Birdscape of the Week. This is sent to us by uh, Monty up in Wilton, New York. And uh, he says, happy springtime to you guys. I wanted to share a snap of my backyard birdscape. We live in upstate New York and things are blooming here, as you can see, this spring. Without too much effort, this backdrop attracts a wide variety of colorful birds, including cardinals, robins, hummingbirds, blue jays, and woodpeckers. What do you think, says Monty? Good job, good job. And it's all about food. If you can provide the food, you got the birds. And uh, the variety of food makes a variety of birds. And one important element that I would add to this backyard birdscape is the water element. If you can add water to that, the birds, summertime can be dry and hot and the birds have become a little desperate for water. They need the water. If you can provide the water, you got yourself a happy bunch of birds. That's good, and, and one of the ways you wanna to continue to kind of keep that flushed out too, is there a recommendation for that? You don't want the water to stay too stagnant over a five or six day period. No, you don't. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Okay. Uh, birds aren't that finicky. When it comes to natural uh, sources of water, it's a jungle out there. And sometimes those little murky pools provide an ad added uh, incentive with a little more protein. Good. Well, and as we continue on into the spring, we'll see how things go, but it's been pretty dry so far and it will continue to dry out, at least as things look now in the longer range forecast that things will stay dry. So that's a good thing for folks to know to make sure you can keep water out there for your little feathered friend. Food and water and shelter, uh, main ingredients for a happy backyard birdscape. Now, one bird that you've probably seen here and there is the great blue heron. They are uh, fairly common around the United States. I want to take you up to York, Maine, with photojournalist David Hewitt and his filming of a beautiful colony up there behind his house in a little bog. Check this out. We're here on the beautiful southern seacoast of Maine, here in the town of York and inland about three or four miles across the street from the York River Basin, which is a tidal basin. There's a pond called Bolter Pond. It's about two miles long. And right on the back side of it is what we know as Bass Cove. And here in Bass Cove is Blue Heron Colony number 734. We have a very healthy colony. Right now we have about 12 pairs nesting with chicks. Baby herons are uh, really hungry this time of year and uh, it's quite amazing. These creatures to me are prehistoric. They take you back in time. Their grandness and their beauty is just breathtaking. When you see them spread their wings and come in for a landing to feed their young, and you look at these nests, they build these huge structures on top of these very high trees. The birds are kind of all tucked in. You don't think there's even a bird in it. You might see mom's little head, but lo and behold, there's four birds in there. 
And then you watch them preen themselves. They have these gorgeous feathers, this expanse of these long taluses. Another thing when you're out here is that there are so many other birds. The swallows are just flying around eating bugs. The pileated woodpecker is pecking away at all these dead trees. The great crested flycatcher is standing there chirping away. There's so much activity. It's absolutely beautiful. Coming out here is, in a way, really settling. It's really grounding. If you ever have the chance to go observe a blue heron colony, I would definitely take advantage. That was really something else. What did you think? Well, actually, the great blue heron is a magnificent bird. They, they give an aura of prehistoric birds. I mean, they look gargantuan. They look like something out of the Archaeopteryx days. And yet, as big as they are, they nest on the top of these spindly dead trees. They build this huge nest of sticks woven together where they raise three or four babies who grow up very fast and become very big in this stick nest on top of a dead tree in the swamp. They nest in colonies because their habitat is scarce enough that they all have to get along to make the best use of the available nesting sites. That's maybe a good lesson. People getting along, birds getting along to say, hey, this is all we have, let's get it done. That's all right. It works for them and I think they work it out well. And what about the other birds that we saw in David's piece, how do they, cohabitate with them? Is there competition? Do they, or are they just sort of on different paths? They pay no attention to each other. Uh, that said, the kingbird nesting in that swamp will pay close attention to the heron. The heron might, if the opportunity comes up, snag a baby kingbird or another bird. As they, uh, Again, it's a jungle out there and they will do what they got to do. On the other hand, a bald eagle or a great horned owl finding a young, small heron in the nest. Um, easy come, it, it's a job. So, but uh, those things are few and far between. The, the eagle would be more interested in the fish in the pond, mm -hmm. and the great horned owl would be more interested in the skunk in the woods. I see. And so, as you were saying before, these are big, deep nests to accommodate the, the fast growth of these birds. How long do, do the baby herons stay in before they head out into the world themselves? Two or three weeks. Um, it, it, it takes them a while. But they grow at different stages and uh, it, mom and pop are very busy going out, bringing food back, going out, bringing food back all through the day. And meanwhile, these kids in the nest, they, you know, teenage birds have to get along well together because that nest is not that sturdy. And, I see. Uh, so they grow up fast, they become very big, they become very awkward. And sometimes, um, you know, they, they just have to get along. And then they learn how to fly and everybody goes to, off to college and they're in their separate ways. And then winter comes, everything freezes up and down they go, to, off to Florida and South Carolina. Well, that's great. We Thanks very much to David for putting that piece together. And uh, that's gonna wrap up our first episode of the BirdCast. I hope that you've enjoyed it. We wanna hear what you think want to talk a little bit more and help educate you in terms of birds. I'm learning a ton just by hanging out with Rich. It's going to kind of rub off a little bit and that's what we want to do for you as well. So join us next time as continuing into this warmer weather, well, birds continue to do their thing and their habits and their patterns change as the weather gets warmer and we get into the dog days of summer and I'm looking forward to hearing else, what else you have to say about that. Me too. I can't wait to get back out again. We'll be out again soon. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.